Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Beth Levison, one half of the directing duo behind the independent documentary film Storm Lake, which premiered this week at the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival. Storm Lake follows Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Art Cullen and his family's efforts to unite and inform their Iowan rural farming community through their biweekly newspaper, Come Hell or Pandemic. We're so grateful for this chance today to discuss how we can sustain the future of local news from Iowa to North Carolina. Huge thank you to Full Frame for co-sponsoring this panel alongside the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy at Duke University. But before we dive in with our esteemed panel today, I want to share with you uh, the trailer for the film. Here it comes and I hope you enjoy it. In a small Northwest Iowa town, the storm like times weaves the fabric of the community in large ways and small. Yeah, right? <laughs> We're on deadline, we're ready to put it on the page. I get real uptight about deadlines. Readers decide our future, not any branch of government. We have happy stories about all types of people. You're a singing star. <laughs> Most people in Storm Lake care about community. Hey guys. But how long does a community support journalism? Because now people want to get their news for free and people are saying, oh well, that's not worth a dollar. And that's not how you sustain a democracy. <laughs> We've always operated at the break-even point. Seven dollars. Mom and pop stores that were the basis of our advertising are gone. How else do you make a small community survive? All the meat packing plants are infected with COVID. No one's even talking about testing at this point. How sickening it is forcing immigrant workers into a deadly workplace. And to me, there are blatant forms of racism and there are subtler forms of racism, but it's racism all the same. We were the first ones to say a number of Tyson employees tested positive. And then there was this dramatic spike and it was unbelievable. We're continuing to report on the numbers as best we can. Now, Storm Lake is the hottest spot in the country. It's been a pretty stressful time, and we're losing money, and there ain't anything you can do about it. Our ads fell off a cliff. It doesn't make a lot of sense to go borrow money when we could just walk away from it now. You can change the world through journalism. The reporter is the cornerstone in a functioning democracy. And without strong local journalism, the fabric of the place becomes frayed. The prospect of the newspaper not being around terrifies me. So if we do the right things here, we'll be all right. So let's get that story. And now we dive in. It is my tremendous honor to introduce our moderator for this conversation, Penelope Muse Abernathy or Penny Muse Abernathy. Penny was also the advisor to the film and an incredible asset and supporter. She is a leading expert on US news desert and her expertise is the state of local news and newspapers and the development of sustainable business models. In her work as the Knight Chair at the University of North Carolina, she produced two books on business models and four on local news. She is currently a visiting professor at Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism and associated with the Local News Initiative. Please take it away, Penny. Thank you for joining us here today. And I wanted to sort of as moderator, uh, put into context what we're going to be talking about today. A little bit, very little bit about me. I got my start in this business working on the local weekly paper. Uh, the journey since then took me through a number of weeklies uh, and uh, on both the business side and dailies on the and large dailies uh, ranging from the New York Times uh, uh, to uh, the Dallas Times Herald as both journalist and as a um, as a business executive. I came back to my home in North Carolina 
uh, all, more than 15 years ago and was struck by how much the landscape had changed. I came back as the night chair in journalism at the University of North Carolina uh, and began to reconnect with my roots in local journalism, uh, looking at uh, developing sustainable business models because of uh, the realization of how important local newspapers are to this democracy and to the sense of community that we need in order to uh, build a better future. Uh, I based my uh, much of my initial research around seminal research that was done at the University of North Carolina in the 1970s that showed that local newspapers were often the single best uh, uh, vessel for informing citizens and residents in a democracy and giving them the information they needed in order to make good quality of life. As many of you know, over the last decade, 15 years, Many local newspapers have struggled to survive. We've lost more than a fourth of uh, the newspapers we had in 2005, for example. Uh, I'm here today to talk about three incredible survivors. They're not just su survivors, they're strivers who look every day to bring the best of, of, of the, the world right to the doorstep of the, the people who are live in those communities and also highlight what needs to be improved so that we can live uh, in a, uh, and, in, and, and enjoy a quality of life for ourselves as well as for future generations. Uh, the uh, papers today prove that there, you, know, you don't need to go to the big city to uncover big news. We have with us two uh, Pulitzer Prize winning papers. Uh, Art, as you know, uh, introduced, uh, uh, won the Pulitzer in 2017. Les High, who is with us today, his grandfather won the Pulitzer Public Service Award uh, in, 2000, in uh, 1953 for uh, exposing uh, the infiltration of the Ku Klux Klan into local police and um, uh, fire, uh, 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 into the police and fire offices in his uh, town of Columbus County in southeastern North Carolina. Uh, Lorena, uh, has uh, uh, puts out La Prensa, which covers La Prensa, Iowa, which covers the news of a, a growing immigrant community in that uh, in that state. Uh, all of them are grappling with the issues that affect uh, uh, local journalism, and both are struggling to figure out ways that you find funding to cover the underserved communities uh, that they themselves cover whether it's through philanthropic giving and, or through uh, donations from people like you or through uh, for-profit business models. We're going to talk about all of that today. I want to introduce each one of them uh, separately. Art started out, he says, as a copy boy at the Minneapolis paper uh, and got bitten by the bug at that point. He worked at uh, several uh, dailies throughout Iowa before hearing the call back from his brother to come back and work for him at the Storm Lake Times, which was established in 1990. Lorena worked as a journalist for almost 10 years in her native Nicaragua uh, before coming to the, immigrating to the US in the 1990s and working in a local hospital. Literally her paper was formed in 2016, she says, sitting at the kitchen table talking with her son uh, who had, uh, was at the University of North uh, Iowa and had, uh, was an entrepreneur and talking about what stories were not being done to cover the immigrant communities and what needed to be done. And finally, we have Les High, third generation um, uh, uh, member of his family to, uh, to oversee the paper uh, in uh, Southeastern North Carolina, the news reporter. Uh, all of these papers uh, have circulations in the uh, single digit uh, thousands or maybe 10,000. All of them serve economically struggling communities and all of them serve very diverse communities. Uh, Les has worked for the last two years, not only to transform the newspaper he works for, but also to set up a new digital enterprise that he hopes will inform uh, and engage uh, citizens in communities outside of uh, his own home uh, county. They are four of the poorest counties in North Carolina and four of the most diverse, including not only uh, Hispanic populations and black populations, but also the largest population of Native Americans east of the Mississippi. It is a very interesting time uh, in this country, a very pivotal moment for local news. 
Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is just start by asking each one of them to reflect on the last year. Uh, 2020 was uh, in many ways a uh, year of many big news headlines uh, on a local level. And Art, I want to start with you and ask you, what, do you, what did you learn over the last year and how is that going to affect your journalism and your practice going forward? You're going to need to unmute. Excuse right. me. I think one of the big things I, I love, my big takeaway, as it were, <clears throat> is that uh, readers are desperate for factual information. Uh, and with uh, Donald Trump, the great prevaricator, and uh, a lot of misinformation regarding the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, people more and more were turning to uh, newspapers for steady factual information. And it just proved to me how vital it was. Uh, uh, that's my takeaway. Uh, I'm in the uh, movie, we talk about how you and Lorena uh, began to kind of come together too and cooperate in many ways in thinking about uh, things going forward. Lorena, what has it meant for you to, uh, uh, to live through the past year and to cover it from a, a perspective that perhaps wasn't covered by mainstream newspapers? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, in the last several years, uh, we seen that social media has been the enemy number one for newspapers around. Um, in, in, in 2021 was a hard year uh, nationwide, but for our uh, rural community, uh, it was devastating. It was devastating because because uh, not just uh, the general population was being uh, misinformating by social media. So what I learned, I learned that Latinos that are my target, uh, they look for the fact, they look for that information because they know the local journalists, they know the people that they can trust and they can talk. But talking um, very shortly about the, the, the 2021 with 2020, I think that uh, the rural communities need more than ever, the local journalists, because it's the people that we interact uh, uh, they, uh, every day, churches, parties, even in the bar. So um, I think that it was a hard year, 2021, but we all learned something about. Right. Les, how about you? you? You've been working at the paper since you graduated from college with only a six week break to uh, go find yourself as you drove all the way to Alaska and came back uh, several years after starting at the paper. You've advanced from photographer to reporter to uh, now publisher of the paper. What have you learned over the last uh, uh, year that was different from what you might have learned over the, the previous 30 or so? Well, uh, we're definitely coming out of a rough patch, Penny. Um, you know, there was a time when I remember you know, really the money just walked in the door uh, way back when, and um, and now that's not not the same. We've been highly disrupted by social media and and other players, um, and then COVID hit. Uh, you had disruption of the small businesses across the board, and those are our main advertisers. Um, and then, of course, we're the enemy of the people, apparently. So we have to deal with all, all of that. So um, it, it has been a rough patch. We may talk about this later, but I'm cautiously optimistic about the future. I would say that one thing that I have learned, Penny, is that um, the basic tenets of journalism don't change. You know, we've been through this whole thing of misinformation and when you lose a newspaper, it's this vacuum is created that's a lot of times filled by a very dark hole of misinformation. 
but those same tenets are, are, are so important. That's um, to be fair, to be truthful, uh, to be honest in your report, to be transparent. Um, yeah, I think about my grandfather back in 1953 when uh, they were fighting the Ku Klux Klan and I mean, they carried guns. They literally um, feared for their lives. It's a very dangerous time. And I often wonder if we have, um, as journalists today, that, that level of courage where, I mean, they were threatened to lose their business and their lives, but yet they, they persevered. And um, Penny, I, I think we do have that level of courage today. Journalists today are having to fight through uh, job layoffs and the threat of job layoffs and, not, and don't have the resources that they once had. But it's a tough environment that we're fighting against this label uh, that we um, um, that that we are in fact not not part of that fabric of America that we're somehow different, and I think that leads to where we have to listen to people more. You know, decisions used to be made from the top down. Now they're made from the ground up, or at least they, they should be. Listen to people, but at the end of the day, it's all about accountability, trust, and all those things that build for for good journalism. Right. Yeah, uh, I want to remind, I want to take a pause here because I think is uh, uh, the last minute uh, uh, intro for the uh, program. Um, uh, I forgot to mention to the folks that they, we really want to have this as an interactive discussion. For those of us who are joining us live today, please feel free to post your, uh, your questions in the Q&A and we will try to uh, answer as many as we can. Uh, I want to pick up less on what you said and I want to go back to uh, to Art. Art, I don't know what you've done with your Pulitzer Medal. Um, it, it, Les's grandfather had quite a character as, a, uh, as an editor. Uh, he apparently used his medal as a paperweight, uh, wrote an editorial. Actually, the, um, uh, the, the news reporter did front page editorials in an effort to uh, rid the county of the Ku Klux Klan. And he said in the end, the, in essence, the the honor didn't mean much. What really was important was he said, we believe the richest harvest from this experience is a renewal of our faith in the soundness of an awakened citizenry and a restoration of full confidence that justice can triumph in any community. So I, wanna, I would love to have you kind of think, think about what you see your paper as uh, important in terms of a civic institution. What is your civic mission? What is your civic role? What is the role of a small community paper in uh, Storm Lake or in any small town in our, our rural community in this country? Well, at the most basic level, I think it's to be a mirror on the community, and, you know, good, bad, uh, whatever, and that reflects the quality of life in the community. Again, good, bad, mediocre, and uh, that's at the basic level. That's what, we, what we're trying to do is reflect the community in all its dimensions. And that's difficult, <laughs> especially when, you know, there's 30 languages spoken in Storm Lake. And so that's a real challenge for us. Uh, not only, you know, we don't, not only Latinos here, we have people from Myanmar and, you know, Somalia, Sudan. Uh, so it's, it, you know, that's, it's challenging you know, being a, an accurate reflection and a full reflection of the, all those different communities. And we're in, uh, Les and I, and, uh, you know, are in somewhat of a unique position that way, I guess, uh, if we're being rural communities and that highly diverse. Um, and, you know, it's, it's that also in the constitutional sense, it's to be the fourth estate, that is the check on government. We uh, won a Pulitzer for editorial writing, but it all started by my son covering the county board of supervisors, other states call them county commissioners. Covering the county board of supervisors spend most of their days talking about how to eliminate noxious weeds. And uh, they were dragged into uh, a lawsuit involving water quality uh, and agricultural pollution. That's how we found out about it. Uh, and, uh, so we were being, you know, we're there watching government, uh, school boards, city council, county board of supervisors, zoning boards. And, you know, we're paying Tom a pittance, but we are paying him. And, and uh, 
that's what we do. And then other outlets take our information, rip and read it uh, for their benefit, and we get no benefit. And uh, so that's the juncture we're at that Les referred to. I, I think you raise an interesting point, Art, uh, and, and one I think that goes um, unnoticed by most uh, people who are, aren't familiar with how much of an ordinary journalism is just showing up. Uh, and then uh, and wading through the mundane, uh, whether it's noxious weeds or uh, someone complaining about uh, no one showed up to do something that they were supposed to do. And it, it's kind of knowing that's a story that's important and asking why is it important? Yeah, and uh, so we asked, they were getting sued and we asked a basic question, gee, how are you gonna pay for this lawsuit? How are you gonna pay for your defense? could cost a million dollars. And they said, we have friends. And we said, oh, gee, well, who are your friends? And they said, none of your business. And that's, that's, where, that's when we got on the warpath. And, uh, but it started out with that basic question, how much does it cost and who's paying for it? Right, and, and Les, I mean, I, I think there's a similar story you've had too, where uh, in the last uh, few months, you've had to, really pry the information out of sources. You, you have to routinely do that. Uh, talk about that for a moment and what that means in today's journalism. You, you mentioned the whole notion of being set up as kind of the enemies of the, of the people. How does that play out in a small town and what does that mean about your role as a journalist in a small town? Yeah, and, and so uh, I'll give you an example. Penny. We, uh, we have, um, we have not had a, a, a real good relationship with our sheriff here. And it started with an editorial that we wrote about, um, he had some military style vehicles that were painted with a bunch of tiger teeth and that, that kind of thing. And so um, we also wrote a second editorial not long after that, that, uh, that he had hired a county commissioner to be a, a bailiff and the commissioner would control his purse ring and raise the question, is that a conflict of interest? Well, a couple of days after that, we stopped getting estimate reports. And this happened for about a month. And um, it's not a great time in the newspaper business to spend a lot of money on lawsuits. So there was going to be no, um, you know, no uh, resolution of that. So we found a couple of partners, America's newspapers gave us a grant, and, um, and we took them to court. And, uh, and we won and also got attorney's fees. But... Uh, had we lost that case, they're, they're pretty expensive, as, as we all know. But you know, that's that's just part of what we do. Sometimes um, the money isn't everything. You've got to do things on principle. Lorena, how do you think about covering uh, your community? You know, it's spread out. It's much larger than uh, uh, the geographic confines of what uh, Art and uh, Les look at. How do you think about, how do you identify the stories you're going to cover? Are there specific... Um, uh, uh, institutions you look to to make sure you're always there, the equivalent of the county commissioners or the, uh, the planning board or the health department? What, how do you think about covering uh, the community of, uh, in, in Western Iowa? So, um, La Prensa is making for Latinos, uh, for, uh, Latinos for Latino, to Latinos. My, my focus, the, uh, my focus are Latinos. I go to the churches, I go to the parties, I talk with people in the uh, supermarket, and I interact and I ask them, what do we like to see in La Prensa? What is affecting you in your community that uh, we can look for information to educate more the Latino community. So they, uh, they, they give me all that information and I go to the city. I go to different places to look for the information. And the example, per, uh, uh, the perfect example I can put you is just yesterday. Uh, I received like 10 phone calls and a lot of uh, text message from a small community in Denison, Iowa. 
and people Latinos that live in that area was very scared because uh, it's the lion, mountain lion that is going around. And it's a lot of kids if are not in school, so they say, they call me, they send me texts, they send me pictures, and they say, we already called to the authorities, uh, to the sheriff, to the police department, and they are not listening to us, listening to us. So I call to the sheriff office, to the police department, to the DNR, and everybody was in the mall home area where the lion, mountain lion has been seen. Uh, all the three institutions was in there. So this is a perfect, with, with this I want to tell you that it's a perfect example. People not me, uh, give me the information. They call me because the Latino community, um, and it's the truth, has been underserved in our areas. And it's not enough information there in Spanish. And um, even when a lot of institutions, hospitals, uh, the banks, the, uh, they have uh, people who translate, you know, but it's, it's different. It's different that somebody transmit my message, my need, that I, what I need, uh, go through another person for somebody uh, help me with that. Um, my point in this is that in big time, the Latino community has been uh, uh, underserved in our areas. So la prensa try to fill it up that gap and we have, la prensa have a close connection, direct connection. People know that they can call me or ask me questions and I will go and look for that. So that is the kind of journalists that we need in our areas, in our rural areas. And, and, and it's not just um, about the Latino community, it's about also the white people. They also have some kind of problems, you know, in their community and they go to our colleagues, to my colleagues, and. Uh, that connection, the small community with the journalists is very, very important. And it's that, that we need to continue to do something for this uh, survival. Art, Art, what have you done with your Pulitzer Medal? And uh, <laughs> uh, talk to me a little bit about what Les was talking about too. How difficult is it to get the information? You live in this community. Uh, how, how difficult was it to get the information you needed for your editorials? How, how do you approach that? And does it ever influence exactly what you're able to write or, or what you're able to actually pursue? Well, first, uh, we didn't get a medal because we didn't win public service like oh, Les's right. like yeah. paper did. We won for editorial writing. And so we got a nice fat check, which immediately went to pay down debt. <laughs> And, uh, and then we got a diploma from Columbia University uh, that I nearly left in a restaurant when the waiter took it away thinking it was a menu <laughs> uh, in New York City, seriously, just two hours after I picked it up. And I, uh, we were looking through all the cupboards in this restaurant for that diploma to prove I graduated. Um, and uh, yes, we, we for the, the, the story, and a series of editorials that we won the Pulitzer about were, were about a, a lawsuit filed by the Des Moines, Iowa Waterworks, which delivers water to 500,000 central Iowa consumers. And they sued three Northwest Iowa counties, including Buena Vista, our county. And uh, Lorena would say Buena Vista. In Iowa, we say Buena Vista, <laughs> Madrid, and Nevada. Uh, they sued our board of supervisors and uh, they were getting their money secretly. They refused to tell us who they were getting their money from. And we kept pressing and pressing through the Iowa Freedom of Information Council, which is a nonprofit uh, in Des Moines, uh, to release the information of who their donors were. And they refused. And so we asked if we could, maybe we should sue to force the disclosure of the donor list. And the Freedom of Information Council had $3,000 at their disposal. And no other news media came forward to help. And of course, we're flat broke. And so we just had to drop it. 
Uh, our own reporting told us who the major donors were, but we couldn't get the whole list. We never did. Uh, but at least we showed that Monsanto and uh, the Koch brothers uh, were the prime funders. Uh, we did that through our own reporting uh, outside of any court documents. Uh, but that shows you, you know, yeah, so we, you don't always get the whole story. We still don't have the whole story five years later. Uh, and we never will, uh, unless somebody coughs it up. Uh, and we run into that every day, you know. Again, the sheriff isn't real good about returning our phone calls because uh, he can be elected for life. What's he care? And, uh, you know, and now the police department controls their information by releasing only things on Facebook. And then so then we have to go to Facebook to gather our information. And so that's how things are changing. And yes, it, it, there, are, there are walls put up twice a week to us gathering information. And it was especially so during the pandemic when the meatpacking industry was conspiring with the state to suppress testing and testing report uh, information not only to, to prevent the tests from occurring, to per, but to prevent the data from being released. And uh, so it's just constant. Well, I think you, you raise an interesting point because I think um, one of the things that gets lost in all of this that actually Les pointed out to me about a, a, a decade ago is that you know there was a time when newspapers were fat and happy and you didn't have to worry about that, but the smart newspaper used that as a cushion so that when you did run up against the, the story that you just couldn't get the information for or, or that the story that was really controversial that you might uh, uh, be sued for for libel, you at least had a cushion to go. We uh, never had that cushion ever. You never, you never did. But but in di a different time in the the eighties and the nineties, it was a it was a very different situation. And you don't have that cushion today. It requires resourcefulness. It requires like you just talked about. It requires basic shoe leather of doing a lot of reporting and trying to get around it, e even on sources you should normally have. I mean, the Freedom of Information Act is designed to help you as journalists get the information that helps us as citizens know what's actually uh, occurring behind the scenes and being done in, in with supposedly yeah. our interest uh, from in all a small of town, you have to know which battles to pick, you know, yeah. and down there in North Carolina, that battle with the sheriff, you're just never going to win it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, you just got to know which ones to pick and which ones you can survive. Well, and it also points out a need as people think about how they can help journalists and help local journalists at this time. There is a need for a lot of uh, legal help often in terms of trying to get that information that is legally yours too. Um, I, I want to bridge back to something that Lorena kind of asked about and uh, it, start with you Art, uh, but would love to uh, kind of get a, a, a notion from the entire panel. One of the things that's interesting is how much trust has declined in media over the last uh, two decades. Uh, there's a lot of research that attributes that to uh, the, the increasing polarization we see at the national level that's filtering down. The most recent uh, surveys done by Knight, the Knight Foundation, however, found that trust in local media is still much higher than it is in national media or even regional media. Uh, that trust, how do you engender trust in, in uh, what you're doing? And there's a wonderful question about how do you differentiate yourself and, um, and, and from the misinformation and disinformation that just flows freely on uh, social media? Well, I think you build trust by uh, being accurate, first of all, and by correcting your mistakes prominently and swiftly. And I think that's how, really how you build trust. That, and I, you know, uh, again, Showing up as night, you know, what, what, how does it go? 99% of, of uh, success is showing up. Well, you know, when you show up at the Buena Vista College basketball games and talk to the president uh, of BV, or, or you're at the pork producers' uh, pork feed, uh, you build trust that way by being in your community. And we are. Uh, and weren't, you know, it's unlike foreign owned papers who uh, the publisher lives 60 miles away. Uh, you know, the publisher lives five blocks away here. 
and you know where to find him. And uh, so uh, I think that's that's a lot of why local media is trusted to the extent that it remains locally owned. Uh, you know, you know where to find the Cullen brothers and straighten them out. Uh, Les, how about you? I mean, how do you think about trust? How do you think about um, uh, uh, building that in a community as diverse as what you cover and, is, and struggling as, as much as it is economically? Well, um, it helps to live here for my entire life and to be third generation. Uh, I can assure you that if you get something wrong, um, and you go to church on Sunday, you're going to hear about it. Yeah. And uh, so that, that builds accountability. So, um, but yeah, there are a lot of challenges, Dave. Um, you know, social media is such a strong force out there. And the algorithms send people into these echo chambers and they, or they're getting to what they, they want to hear. And it's often wrong. Um, it, I think it goes back to what I said earlier, what Art said, um, be as trustworthy as possible. I mean, who else is going to go to a five-hour school board meeting and sit through that and then come out on the other side and give uh, you know, information that people need about their kids? And uh, somebody said shoe leather earlier. I mean, um, I mean, we're in a very advanced time with technology and we're doing all kinds of that here. But at the end of the day, and there's one thing to take away from this um, event today, it is that old fashioned journalism where you're just trying to tell the truth and build trust that way. And, and Les, do you, do you take it upon yourself? How do you correct the, the disinformation, misinformation that's on social media? Do you even try to? Um, we really don't, unless it's put out by a public official and that happens more than you might think. Uh, you would know by now they would have learned. Um, but um, so no, we, we don't try to correct that. We, we do what, what we do. We get criticized a lot on social media. Um, we're in a fairly, we're in a really conservative area and we take a fairly progressive stance on things. So uh, when a lot of our editorial opinions and we still write pretty strong editorials are, are, are not, not popular. So it, it's, it's not an easy fight, but one that we keep keep doing. Speaking of editorials, do you endorse political uh, candidates uh, or vet them? Uh, do you vet them or do you endorse and do you endorse them for uh, local, state and national office? Yeah, so we just cover Columbus County and we don't do anything from a statewide level. Um, the only time we've endorsed candidates in the past is when uh, there's been an emergency. And that's when, uh, let's say you've got um, a, a mayor and you've got somebody running against the mayor who would just destroy the town. It would just be a terrible situation. So infrequently we have done that. We've chosen to do, I think, a really good job of interviewing candidates, getting those online and in, in the paper and, and let people make their own decisions. I, I, I guess I'm concerned is that if we endorse a candidate that if you cover the candidate and he wins, he becomes a county commissioner or school board member. If you've endorsed him, uh, then you're in his back pocket. And if you, if you haven't endorsed him, then you're always against him. So I guess that's probably an overriding fear of endorsements. Uh, but again, we, we've had what we thought was just a, uh, a really bad candidate out there. We, we would endorse the good one. And so Art, how about you? Yeah, uh, you, uh, aside from being in Illinois, in Iowa, how do you, uh, what do you think about editorial endorsements and uh, what I, you, you are, I think you made the times back in 2008 for being the first to endorse a candidate that year. Well, we were the first paper in America to endorse Joe Biden when he ran in the Iowa caucuses and lost for the 10th time. And uh, so that tells you what our endorsements are worth. Uh, but yeah, we do endorse uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, not all local races like school board uh, when there aren't enough differences to distinguish candidates. Uh, but we definitely do for county supervisor, for uh, state house, uh, Congress. And then because of the Iowa caucuses, we do uh, presidential endorsements. And Iowa's a little unique in that respect. They expect it of you. And there's a long tradition of endorsing candidates in Iowa uh, that, that was led by the Des Moines Register. Uh, which was once one of America's greatest newspapers and now is owned by a hedge fund or something. 
So, Lorena, do you do an editorial endorsements in La Prensa? No, we don't. No, we don't. Penny, we, we cover from presidential uh, candidates to city council, but we don't endorse. We mm -hmm. don't do any like, endorse. And I would like to add a little bit, I would like to have a, something to say about Ruas, um, how we get it Ruas, if you allow me yeah. uh, to do that. Thank you. So, um, you know, I think it was the, the our readers, Latinos, Asian, white, every race in our rural communities, Lat eh, 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 our readers eh, to us in local journalists, because how art in less was eh, saying that uh, we are we are we are not people, special people. We are town people. You know, we we have neighbors. We see people. Uh, they see us in the churches, and they see us in the activities in our local downtowns area. So uh, it's people that talk to us. And in the way, in my case, uh, with Latinos, uh, I I combat. I try to combat the 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 misinformation. Uh, no, no in the paper, but, but, but because we are a local people that we uh, know one each other in the different towns, people ask questions and I try to uh, tell them my opinion. For example, with the COVID-19, all those theories that can, that going to leave you blind that if you get the COVID-19 vaccination and going to sterilize the woman, it was thousand and thousand and thousand of people, believe it or not, uh, that they call and they ask me, do I should be getting essential, essential workers from Smithfield, from Smithfield to Tyson and quality food in the different areas, counties that I cover, people was call, uh, calling me about the vaccination. So, uh, la prensa not only have the trust the our readers, but also um, we educate in the way that we try to tell people, just remember how it's back home. How is in El Salvador when we got vaccinated? It was a lot of theories that people say back home in, in different countries in Latin America, the vaccination going to leave you blind. So I say, Do you got blind when you got your vaccination back home in El Salvador or in Mexico or in Guatemala? No, it's the same thing. You need to listen what um, the education information is telling you, know what the social media. So my point to this is, for finish, uh, my intervention in this is social media is killing the community, our small community papers, but not just the newspaper. It's killing also our um, our our uh, our population. It is playing with the play, with with the mind of our population. The beauty about this, to me, after the pandemic, is that people still trust in the local media. And I am not talking just about Latinos. I am talking also a lot of white readers because I have a lot of white readers people that uh, they ask me questions to. So um, I just wanna say that that we, we are very blessed to be a local journalist and we have to continue fighting against the bombardment uh, the of social media. So I think there, there are two things that I heard in what I, each of you talked about. One is transparency, right? People know you, you're there. The other is visibility. You're also That's there, right. you're, you're on the ground. So that gives you lots of chances to interact, to engage uh, uh, and, and think about what is really on the minds of the people that are in your community. Um, I, I wanna pick back up though and, and talk about two questions and kind of combine them that have been posted uh, by uh, people who are listening in. And, um, and it really concerns, I think, about both how you think about journalism differently going forward. 
right? Uh, in, in everything from what is the major threat uh, to your journalism? Is it the local person who starts a blog? Uh, and if that is the, the threat, how do you deal with that? You know, if you, you lose a newspaper, is the blog the substitute? Or, or what, what, you know, how do you continue to get, gain, garner that trust? And it, it very speaks, it speaks to something that was in the um, uh, Columbia Journalism Review today about the, the notion that getting a Pulitzer does not really help your business in many cases. It's <laughs> something you do from the, the heart, something you do because you have a mission uh, to do it. it. In fact, in many cases, winning a Pulitzer can be the worst thing uh, you can do for your businesses, uh, your business as of a, being a newspaper publisher because it threatens a whole strain of uh, your revenue from uh, advertisers who get irritated to just uh, citizens who want to cancel their uh, their subscriptions. So, uh, you know, Les, you have been working for a couple of years on a vision to uh, kind of expand coverage of underserved communities, not just in the area you are, but in the, uh, adjacent counties. Um, and you've thought about it too, I think in an interesting way in that you're not in competition, right? What you're really trying to do is furnish the, uh, make the, the information widely available, even to your, what might be considered your competitors, but to newspapers in adjacent counties that are owned by private equity companies <laughs> or hedge funds and have, have really suffered from a lack of, uh, 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 feet on the ground, so to speak, or reporting uh, in those areas. So you're tackling the big picture issues. Uh, you're calling it the border belt independent, it's digital. Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of curious what your vision is. How do you see that kind of rolling out? And I think the other interesting thing is, is funded by a major grant from a major foundation in North Carolina. And I think one of the issues that we've seen over the last decade is that foundations have tended to not realize how important they can be in funding news and in, in encouraging uh, information. So it's an encouraging sign by a, a North Carolina foundation to reach out into areas that might not have gotten uh, philanthropic funding otherwise. Yeah, so the, the Border Belt Independent uh, is funded by the Kate D. Reynolds Charitable Trust and they care a lot about the challenges that are facing the, in these four counties. So these are four counties on the South Carolina board, very poor, very diverse. The demographics, unfortunately, are the same in a lot of ways. Um, you know, uh, lack of opportunity, poor health. Um, children have a tough time growing up in those counties. And those are all things that KP Reynolds uh, care about. And so I had a conversation with Adam Linker, who is um, uh, one of their uh, people on the ground. and. At the end of the day, uh, how do you fix those problems if you don't know what they are? And I think that's part of our mission is to tell complicated stories that no one wants to talk about. And we're doing this over a four county region. We're partnering with the six local newspapers, including the student newspaper at UNC Pembroke, which is a predominantly Native American university. And so what we're trying to do, Penny, is those papers can cover the school board meetings and uh, the commissioners and police and all that. We, we won't, we're not going to do that. We're going to do in-depth reporting on, on, on issues and we'll share those stories with those papers so they don't have that capacity. And we're trying to provide that bandwidth to give them in-depth reporting uh, to make people's people, uh, to, to make their lives better, we hope, with um, for those types of stories, but also to help those newspapers survive because we pity you. You're the one that brought this to my attention that got me thinking about it with your news desert study. And it's a very real thing. And our hope is that if we can make this model work in these four counties, can we replicate it in this rural area and then this rural area where we have good reporting that they can't do and then it makes us all stronger. So, so your notion is you'd rather see a, a newspaper that is that is uh, perhaps not being as robust and as uh, aggressive as it could be, at least exist because you still got coverage of the uh, county commissioners, uh, hopefully uh, from that. And you, what you're trying to do is give the contextual or analytical stories that kind of project out uh, what 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 needs to be done to solve today's problems as well as future problems. 
Art, you and uh, Lorena have just been involved in setting up your own uh, foundation uh, with some kind of similar uh, mission in, involved. Yeah, uh, Lorena and Doug Burns, who owns the Carroll, Iowa newspaper, another twice weekly, and I got together, uh, you know, probably a year ago, started talking. We both were watch watching our advertising uh you know, just vanish during the pandemic. What little advertising we had left going into the pandemic, we both, Carol and us, had lost our car dealers before the pandemic when Detroit decided they weren't interested in newspapers anymore. And uh, that was, you know, $70,000 a year in revenue to us. And so we realized then, even before the pandemic, that we needed to find a different source of revenue. I believe that we are losing the advertising franchise and that we absolutely must switch to reader revenue. Uh, we must derive, you know, probably 75% of our income from readers rather than advertisers. We've got to switch that equation. It used to be you get 75% of your revenue from advertisers and 25% from readers. We need to flip that. Well, that's going to take years. Uh, how, however, there's good signs that we're seeing increased paid circulation since the pandemic. Uh, just as the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Minneapolis Star Tribune and Boston Globe did. So at the community level, again, people were reaching out trying to find factual information and they were paying almost all our growth is digital <clears throat> and uh, at stormlake.com. But to supplant that advertising revenue for what I think is going to be, we're going to need it for about five years or so, it, we're going to have to get donations to help support these local family-owned newspapers, La Prensa, the Storm Lake Times, and the Carroll Times Herald, among a couple others, and uh, in this uh, four or five county region of Western Iowa. And uh, so far, we've raised about $50,000 in small donations uh, for the Western Iowa Journalism Foundation, and you can find it online. Western Iowa Journalism Foundation.com. And uh, so that it's an independent board of directors. We don't decide how the money's spent, they do. Um, but, you know, uh, they understand that their, their reason to exist is to support our payroll, essentially. And so we'll just start getting money out of that now this year. And, but we really need to raise about, you know, well over $300,000 to really uh, get us moving and, and we aren't there yet. We're talking with Facebook, we're talking with Microsoft, we're talking with Google and their associated foundations, but they move at glacier-like speed. And, uh, but that advertising franchise, I don't believe is coming back. And so we just gotta raise money to keep the boat afloat uh, until we can build that reader revenue. And, and like uh, Les, I'm confident uh, that that the strong journalism will sell papers and or digital subscriptions and because uh, we're seeing it yeah and and i think that's a good point strong journalism ultimately prevails the issue is how you get from here to there uh right. and and how you you rethink uh, where you get your revenue uh how we as citizens rethink what is the obligation we have to make sure that there's a free flow of information. Um, I think there are bigger philosophical issues as to what happens in economically struggling communities that where people can't afford uh, the, right. the pay for the news. And that, over half our community, you know, doesn't re isn't really literate in their native language. So, right. uh, you know, it's a real challenge. Well, and I mean, I think there, there are a whole host of issues that are wrapped up in two, especially in rural areas. Uh, a, a lack of access uh, to high-speed internet, either because of financial constraints, you just can't afford the couple of hundred dollars to get the, the broadband or the lack of broadband in those areas. And, and I think that all of these are really important issues that will have to be dealt with uh, and, and talked about in, over the next decade as you chart your own course for what happens to local newspapers in whatever form they're delivered in, as well as um, what we as citizens uh, uh, have as a, as a responsibility to, uh, to really help you do your job. Because at the end of the day, how well you do your job helps us 
in terms of the decisions we're going to make every day, whether it's voting for a um, voting for the county commissioner, whether it is deciding where we go to buy groceries, uh, because you are the one that is really kind of giving us that on the ground information, that perspective that you can't get anywhere else. Um, I want to quote. Yeah, I, I, had, I just want to end on a positive note. I, I'm cautiously optimistic that things are going to get better, even though they may look a little bleak now. One is the collaborations with like our nonprofits. You remember, it used to be back in the day, like gladiator times, going <laughs> after stories. You know, we were fighting. Nobody would tell anybody. Anything. It was really competitive. And now we're, we're collaborating. I think that's important. Um, as these corporate newspapers get burned to the ground, you're seeing local ownership come back where businessmen or people in the community say, you know, we want a newspaper here. We need a newspaper. And so they're forming ownerships uh, to do that. And I would encourage everybody looking on today, there's uh, House Bill 7640, it's a Newspaper Sustainability Act. If you have a chance to get behind that, that would give people a $250 credit to buy subscriptions. Uh, it would give uh, pay for some newsroom through tax credits, and it would give tax credits for people to advertise in newspapers. So HB 7640, I think that external help, and I hope they'll force Facebook and Google that have caused all this mess to, to get involved too, and to have this, this bill. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that all this might happen. Well, Les, uh, I, thank you for that, because that's a great segue, and, to, and you've already uh, done your, uh, your concluding bit, but I, unless you want to say more, but I, I, I see that time is running out, and what I wanted to do was do a quick round robin. Uh, uh, I want to start with you, Lorena. If you're looking ahead, what are you optimistic about? Or, and or what would you tell people they could do to help uh, in the situation that we're in? Well, I am very optimistic about that we're going to continue, not just inform people, not keeping the warm, the beauty of, uh, about a small communities. And what I want to tell people, uh, por favor, please, support uh, Western I uh, Iowa Journal Foundation. This is not just about uh, uh, it's about la prensa, about uh, art, uh, this is uh, about uh, care of paper, this is uh, in the future. We, ne we need to get strong. And the future is going to help all the papers, a lot of more papers. So, por favor, subscribe to the English paper. <laughs> and I say English paper because my paper is free. I, I support my paper from advertising. So, support the English paper, support your local journalists, spread the word that local journalists continue to be in life forever because our small communities is totally different than the big cities. We are totally different and we need to help one each other. Um, that, I am optimistic about that. I am optimistic that we are the, uh, the rural area is going to continue with the warm, hard the that farmer that just don't produce the corn and the cow for sale it, but also to revive this community and we need one each other here. Great. So Art, uh, you are the reason we're all here today in your story <laughs> of uh, Storm Lake. So you get the last word. What are you optimistic about or what would you like people to do having seen this, I listened in uh, on this discussion today, what would you like for them to do? Well, the first thing to do is subscribe to a local newspaper, obviously, uh, we'd appreciate it. And uh, especially our local newspaper. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I am optimistic uh, because again, I, I've watched the explosive growth of digital circulation across the country during the pandemic. And it's dropped off since then, especially at the category killers, the Washington Post and New York Times. But it's still growing. You know, it's just not growing 50% a year. Now it's growing 30%. And so we can float the boat. Um, 
and it will happen because I think readers have been sort of shocked into uh, scared straight, you know, uh, they, they were sort of shocked during the Trump campaign and the pandemic into realizing that, that our liberty is in jeopardy. And uh, uh, I think that's our salvation. We hit bottom, I think, I hope. Yeah, I, I think there, you know, I, I've been tracking this for the th over 13 years and some people say to me, what could you possibly be optimistic about? You just uh, give us heart, bad news all the time. And in, in fact, I started tracking the loss of news, uh, both the loss of journalists as well as the loss of newspapers, because it was real important to get a handle on where is the need greatest. Uh, what you three uh, illustrate is that strong journalism can survive. Uh, there is the hope that it not only survives, it thrives in the, the going forward because that has been at the heart of what this country, it, 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 the, it nurturing democracy for over 250 years, starting at the grassroots level. It's also been incredibly uh, important, I think, as Lorena puts out, to building community, to building trust, to building a sense of us in this together uh, going forward. I am actually the most optimistic I've been in the time that I've been tracking it because as Les points out, there's everything from bipartisan legislation at the national level down to the state level. There's an awareness among philanthropy of how important it is to support local news that it's an important humanity as well as uh, supporting art or, or, or other community building functions. Uh, and then I mean, and that's real important too, I think with common citizens. I think if nothing else, last year and especially the COVID crisis really brought home to us how important the local news is. I mean, we depend on local news to, to help us make quality of life decisions uh, that are going to affect us today, affect us tomorrow and affect our future generations of, uh, uh, in, in terms of the decisions we make today. So I wanna thank all of you, uh, all three of you for being here today uh, and for inspiring us all. I, I, I hope that uh, the future brings many uh, positive things for local news and uh, you certainly have paved the way for doing this. I wanna thank um, uh, again, the DeWitt Center which uh, at Duke, which has been at the heart of tracking local news um, and has uh, many of the, much of the research that's been done in recent years has pointed to how very important newspapers continue to be, even though they're under a great deal of duress. Uh, according to research done by Duke, they still produce the most important news on things like education, on the environment, on health, on politics. We rely on them, we continue to rely on them for that very important function of providing us with critical news and information so that we as citizens in a in a democracy and as residents of a community can make good decisions. So thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, please feel free to uh, continue to submit uh, uh, questions to any of these and uh, feel free to donate to any of their causes, uh, their nonprofit causes, whether it's the Border Belt Independent or whether it's uh, the uh, Western, Western Iowa, Iowa Western Journalism, Journalism Foundation. Foundation. Yes. Good. And on that note, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you for joining us. Hey, hey we, 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 we can't let this go. So you thanked us, but really we owe you a big uh, debt of gratitude also. I mean, you you saw this coming before anybody else did. You warned us and here we are. And um, as I said, if you if you don't know about a problem, you can't fix it. Now we're all really trying hard to fix it. So thank you. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for thank you for trying every day and for striving every day. Si se puede, mi hermana. Por supuesto que sí. Gracias. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>